It's nice to meet you, man. Likewise. Thank you so much for coming in. So Thanks I was hoping, for having me. I'm hoping we could talk a little bit about your life and career through music. So I want to play you some music and get some stories about you as to where they fit into your life and career. Does that sound all right? Sounds good to me. Okay, let's take a listen to the first one. <laughs> it's the drums for me that make this dude. How good is that, hey? It's amazing. That was my first song I taught myself how to play on the piano. That's, what is it? It's Tell Me What I Say. Ray Charles. Ray Charles. Right? So, so tell, tell me a little bit about it. But like, why is that song so important to you? Who, who showed you that song? Um, my dad. My dad was always playing it. It was like the one, the one thing he knew how to play on the piano. <laughs> and, you know, it just, I loved it so much. And, uh, you know, I eventually asked him, like, who is that? And I got the, his collection, you know, Greatest Hits collection, Ray Charles. And I set that... Uh, that cassette tape and a cassette player on my uh, piano bench and learned it at like note by note. Why the piano for you? We had one. We had an upright like old piano in the house and it was like a piece of furniture and you know it was just something that I just was gravitated to. It, More so than any sports or yeah. you know hanging out. I just wanted to play piano. I wanted to be in a band and you know. So you weren't you weren't sitting down doing etudes or anything like that. Where you you weren't doing too much Bach or anything like that. No, I took like a handful of piano lessons, and the piano teacher, you know, I had already kind of like taught myself how to play not the right way to play piano, but my way or whatever it is. And I was trying to you know learn theory, and and I took a couple of piano lessons, and the piano teacher told me I'm unteachable and that I'm onto <laughs> something, and that I should just. Go. Oh, that's good. So it was it was your unteachable, but yeah. you're gonna. I, I was playing sophisticated jazz chords or blues chords, whatever it was, um, on my own. I didn't know what the chords were, but I was playing them. So you were just hearing flat nines. I was you like were hearing... receiving satellite or something. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, so was there a specific moment where you said, "I think I want to do this for my life. I want to do this for my career too." There was. Um, I was like just a kid. I was like about 13 years old. And I had this friend of mine, platonic friend at the time. She was uh, this girl, Allison Matz. And her father told me he wanted me to play piano for his guests because he knew I played piano or whatever. And he was having a party. He was a really wealthy guy. Yeah. And um, he gave me $100 after I played this song. I played like Bruce Hornsby or something, the song that Tupac sampled. Oh, that, the way it is. The way it is. Yeah. And um, it was amazing, man. I got my first $100 and I was like, wow. I could probably do this for a living. <laughs> and I did. And yeah, and you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you moved to Philly. You begin your life as a professional musician. You join up with a band called The Roots, and you work on songs like this one. That's The Roots featuring Erica Badu with the song You Got Me, co-written and produced by my guest, uh, Scott Storch. We both did the same thing when that came on. Hmm? We both kind of stared at the table. <laughs> yeah, that's a classic. Uh, was, you know, that's timeless music. It's weird, like, those in those times, man, we were creating chord progressions that were never used before. And, like, I feel like a lot of stuff that's made today is, like, you know, reminiscent of what we created in that period. Like, right now, like, it's happening. There's a, There's so many, like songs that are touching on that mm -hmm. i think about that a lot i think you know getting used to your story and reading about your story i started realizing how much of it i hear now in music and how a lot of the production work and the songwriting you did in in those early days i still kind of hear I, I really want to talk about that how did you end up being in the roots anyway um i left uh my school every day and i wouldn't cut class and you know, go go to the city in Philly, and I, versus I was you know in the suburbs. And I was in ninth grade; it was just starting, and I you know I met this dude Richard Nichols, who's an aspiring music manager, and um, he kind of took me under his wing, and he's like one day he was just like there's this group, they weren't called the Roots then; it was called the Square Roots, mm -hmm. and you know they were just getting started and they were developing their band and they needed a keyboard player, 
So I came in and I, you know, I went to this rehe- this um, excuse me audition, and I brought with me my Fender Rhodes, which at the time nobody wanted a Fender Rhodes. You couldn't give them away. Mm-hmm. Now they're like very expensive again, and they mm-hmm. have like this vintage thing to them. But I should say for people I, listening to this, Fender Rhodes is, is a type of is a type of electric piano, yeah, it's a type of electric yeah, keyboard. Yeah. You hear it a lot of music in the nineteen seventies, late nineteen exactly. sixties. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing sounding, warm instrument. Yeah. And I had one because it was the only keyboard I could find for two hundred dollars at the time. <laughs> you got a Fender Rhodes for two hundred dollars? Yeah. Oh man, you could not do that anymore. Yeah, I mean at that time, <laughs> and they were giving Wurlitzers away, and it was amazing. And I, you know, I had one. And it just was like this perfect fit where everybody else had a, uh, you know, a DX7 or whatever, you know, Korg keyboard was out. I had this thing mm-hmm. and they loved it and the, the sound of it. And it just fit with this, what evolved into being this incredible jazz trio, uh, hip hop jazz trio, Hub, Leonard Nelson Hubbard, myself and Quest Love. And Amir, yeah. the nucleus of all the music. That was it. There was no seven piece 20 piece band like on the tv with the roots it was just us and um and we made we made a sound did you ever you made really amazing music thank you what, what made you step away um i just i wanted to explore more music and i wanted to spend my time in the studio being a creator and not being on the road and all that stuff and i it was just so many times i heard people say, referring to me as the white guy who plays keys in the roots the white root yeah and yeah. and i just was like it had nothing to do with the the white part but it was just it could have been just the guy who's playing keys in the roots like i didn't want to be remembered as the guy who played keys in the roots i wanted to be scott storch the producer and build a you know a whole you know repertoire of music and, and you know and you did. I mean, did that feel like a risk? I mean, I, I, there's a great moment in the documentary about you where I think your girlfriend or something says to you, you don't want to be the Pete Best of the Roots. Exactly, yeah. Pete yeah. Best being the drummer that didn't, you know, stay with the Beatles. Yeah. Um, yeah, my life has been a series of that. Like, if you look at the evolution of, of me and my career, I always have to take a step backwards to take a step forwards. Like, I quit the Roots to become, um, to become a, uh, a producer. And then, you know, my life, not to fast forward too much, but when I did eventually get involved with Dr. Dre, that went on for years and years. And then I realized, you know, this is his empire and this is mm-hmm. his world. This is his aftermath. And mm-hmm. I need to make the first thing for Scott Storch. This guy's already had amazing, you know, death row. And then he built aftermath. I didn't build anything. I, yeah. have, I have to go build my name. You had to build and your own so empire. So I yeah. left L.A. and I moved to Florida, back home to where I was originally from. And. I created a name for myself in like this new sound. I didn't compete and try and make a bunch of West Coast records. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I I changed it up and I you know expanded on what I did again. So I took another step backwards, hoping that like everybody was like, "You're leaving, Dr. Dre. You guys yeah. are on fire right now." Yeah, and this and that. I'm like, it's what I wanted to do. We got. Can we play a little bit of that, Dr. Dre? Snoop Dogg and D.I. D.I. Guess who's back? Steve. Still doing that shit, Andre? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Check me out. That's still DRE by Dr. J, produced by my guest Scott Storch. I saw the piano over there. All I, all, all I could think was I was sitting down before you got in here, and I was thinking like, I didn't even know that was the piano. Or like, I just I think I just always thought that was the sample, you know. I just I didn't know you actually played that. Yeah, I played it. I, I played it on a uh, a Triton, a Korg Triton. Oh wow! Yeah, the the the, the, the gray yeah, factory sound, and we yeah. just compressed it and took all the like lows out of it and just made it really like piercing and. Did you know it was special when you made it? When you came up with that? I did. I did. I, well, Dre let me know it was special because he heard me playing the riff over one of his drum patterns while you know he was like having lunch, and he put his head in. And he was like, "That's crazy," and it was a rap. By the end of the day, the the track went off to Jay Z to get written to, and so history. What did you learn about that time? What was it about? Because the Chronic too, the record that that's off of, is one of the most seminal, important hip hop albums of all time. What what do you remember from that time that really stands out to you? Man, it was incredible. It was it was such a, a a privilege to be in the studio through the making of that album. I mean, 
to be a kid and then like all of a sudden you're hanging out with Snoop Dogg and smoking weed and chilling and and, and, and all these talented people are surrounding you and just everything like the learning and just absorbing it all like how to make an album not just a collection of a bunch of songs from a bunch of different producers and this and that it was an album it was an experience it had skits it was you know Dr. Dre is a uh, he's a genius with that with he knows how to not only make the albums he knows how to pick the talent he knows how to create the records and just being around all that was a crash course. It was like college for me. But it was moving away from samples. I mean, a lot of Dr. Dre's stuff in the early 90s especially was, in late 80s, early 90s, was a lot of samples, a lot of samples. Some, some. And then he had, you know, people in the mix like the Daz Dillinger's and, mm -hmm. and people doing that P-Funk stuff and they were playing, doing replays and stuff. But yeah. There's always been an amount of live elements and bass guitar players coming in. And, right. You know, he's probably the most musical one of the original musical producers. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Scott Storch, a producer, writer, piano player. Uh, we did, you mentioned something earlier that's been sticking with me, is that you know you realized that you needed to build your own self, your own sound, your own empire, instead of just being in the roots or being with Dr. Dre. Um, I feel like a lot happened when this song came out. That is Beyonce with Baby Boy from her debut record, Dangerously in Love, co-written again and produced with, with Scott Storch. And if you're listening to this, you're starting to understand that this guy is everywhere. He's everywhere in, in, in every piece of music you listen to. So this was obviously momentous for you too, right? Yeah, that was an incredible opportunity right there. Um, when you know Beyonce and I got into the studio, we, we did three incredible songs that all became singles and were in the top ten. I think two of them were number ones, and <laughs> it was an incredible run. Did you know then, because look, look what she is now. I mean, right I there. Mean, she she was, was there then. I mean, she was a huge star coming from Destiny's Child, and but it was like on me, it was a little pressure because it was like, okay, she's doing her first album. This thing has to be incredible. Mm -hmm. and I had to reach and reach and, you know, give my best. Did you feel that pressure? I mean, it came naturally, mm -hmm. but, you know, I think days prior to the studio, I was like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Because we created all this stuff live in the studio, and all that intricate production, it takes a long time to make records sound like that. You know, it's not samples. There's breakdowns, interludes, string sections, cellos, you know, there's, there's you know, Middle Eastern flutes and, you know, yeah. layers and layers of stuff to make it a real production. She was patient, and we made... You made some incredible stuff. You really did. And I feel like you what you did there, and I was talking to my buddy about this. He's, a, he's a, a bit of a hip-hop historian. He said, like, it really established the Scott Storch sound. So what you were looking for when you were in The Roots and what you were looking for when you were in Dr. J, I feel like he started to get it around here. And here's a challenge for you. You can get as nerdy as you want to. You can go, you can talk about codas and rests and everything if you want to. But can you on the radio define what you think the Scott Storch sound was or is around that time? Well, I mean... First sound, I'm just to, not to you know go outside of your question. But my first sound. Go was, ahead, man. I started obviously neo soul, hip hop, jazz. We started that. Yeah. Moved, um, you know, out out of uh, Philly to L. A. And we created a new sound. It was this. It wasn't what the West Coast was used to with all these weird synths and like the P funk thing. It was you know G funk or whatever they called it. Mm -hmm. It was this you know symphonic orchestral sounding piano and string driven thing then i moved to florida and you know the music is kind of you know what comes out of us is like what we're feeling or what we're going through and you know here i am i'm now in miami um pretty successful at this point already just through my work that i did with dre and i'm finally like going into the clubs and seeing what's happening and and and, you know, Miami at that time was a really sexy city. So that's what happened. The music started sounding like super sexy and exotic and and it was all pouring out into my music. Did you know you had a definable sound? Was that what something you were looking for? I just, I have always tried to be a pioneer and I tried to go against whatever else is out. Not go against it, but just not do that. Like do what, what I'm going to do and what I like. And I trusted my taste in music and... What I liked at that time was like 
merging into this Middle Eastern thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And lean back, especially I hear yeah. that. There. Like when, when, when I, I was with the roots, I gravitated towards things that I liked as well. Like I was a tribe called Quest fan. Yeah. Die hard. Yeah. And whatever they were sampling, you know, yeah. is what I was emulating. Like things like that or, you know, that world. Not, you know, not the same chords, but that sound. So with this, you know, I was just I was just feeling that. You know, I was listening to a lot of Middle Eastern music, you know, Amir Diab and all this like cool stuff and I just went there. And so you go from chasing down gigs to people really coming to you and you work at this time with like with again, Fat Joe, Christina Aguilera, Lil Wayne, Fifty Cent. You had your pick then. What well, what traits did you want artists to have in order for you to work with them? I mean, obviously I wanted them to be the real deal. I mean, like I there's been, you know, at that time, my price tag was pretty high, yeah. so you know, I, I ended up working with mostly the, the, the you know, the, what the labels felt was you know, was worth spending money on. So they were sending me over, you know, really talented people. Right. You know, there's, you know, you vibe out better with others. You know, certain ones, you know, you get you have a connection with, and you make better music. And that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. You need to have a personal connection with them to make good music with them. Yeah. Right. You get to vibe with them, and you know, you know. Sometimes if you bring the right writer in, you guys can create a smash hit. The artist gets on it. Cool. But, you know, I feel like the most intimate, most incredible music is when the artist is involved in the writing and every step of the way, the melody. And it's, you know, every, you know they, it's, it's more inspired. Scott, it's hard to bring some of this stuff up, but uh, you've been really open about it, and I, I, want to, I do want to ask you about it. You've been really open about your drug use and, and your lifestyle becoming a problem. You said you spent, uh, you blew $100 million and were left with almost nothing. I was left with negative. <laughs> I, I, maybe I don't understand how that can happen. I mean, you know, it's not like there was $100 million there sitting in an account, and I just said, okay, I'm going to spend all of this. It was money coming in. Mm -hmm. And it was money going out, you know what I mean? It accumulated to an amount of like that. But, you know, when you're... I, I spent most of my life, you know, my early life, doing nothing but smoking weed and cooking up in the studio. And it was a healthy lifestyle. And, and then sort of... You, you don't find drugs, they find you. Yeah. And cocaine found me through the likes of... You know, nightlife and females, and yeah. and you know, you want, you end up you want to be the man. And like, I was this dude that was like locked up in a cage with a studio, and I never went out. Like, my boys would come over before my session and be like, "Yo, we're going to the club." Oh, I can't go. I'm working. And then they would come back afterwards and tell me how it was. Yeah. So now, all of a sudden, I'm back in 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 Miami, and I'm I'm getting curious about everything. And I, you know, I leave and I I'm engulfed and thrown into this whole Miami nightlife thing, and it got the best of me. Yeah. And when when you once you go down that road, you're not thinking clearly. You 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 know, you're either thinking about, you know, yeah. you're thinking about mm -hmm. and how to get it and then oh, well, if I have a you know, a yacht and a big bowl of cocaine, I don't think I'm going to have a problem getting any girls over tonight, you know, and you just start you're going down the wrong roads and thinking about the wrong stuff. And then and you're buying again, like you're buying the luxury vehicles 10 at a time yep. while being high, you know? Mm-hmm. How do you find talking about it now? I mean, it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? It did. It hurt a little more when I was completely broke, but, um, you know, seeing the light of day again and, and, and uh, you know, life is comfortable again for me because I'm working really hard. And, mm -hmm. and um, but, yeah, you know, it was just something I did. You know, if I could take it back, I would. But Yeah, you would. You know, yeah, I mean, but, you know, whatever brought me to this point, I'm happy with where I am in my life right now. And, I'm doing well. One of the things in the documentary about you is you say you don't think anyone could have survived what you went through. The, yeah, I mean, I went, for, people aren't very forgiving in the music business or just in general, you know. And, um, you know, I went through a time where, you know, A, I was, you know, broke, I was a junkie, and you would have to hear and read about all this stuff about yourself and, you know. It's crazy, you know. You have to deal with it, but I'm 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 thick skinned. I have a strong stomach, and you know, I put my I got through that, and you know, I guess I was blocking it out and medicating when I was getting high. But yeah. when I quit, and I got sober, and I realized, okay, I'm trying to get back in the music business again and have people take me seriously and 
you know, fix the relationships that I destroyed when I was high and, you know, I was, you know, unmanageable, <laughs> so to speak, for, for A&Rs or for even my management or whatever. Yeah. You know, I just, I had to, I had to deal with that. That, that was the hard part. So how do you, how do you get back into music then? How do you make the priority be music again? Um, well, with sobriety comes clarity and you realize, you know, this is my God given talent. I have to get serious about this. And, you know, I have to, I have a, a family to support and I have, a, you know, a life that I have to live. And, and, um, I had already gotten a taste of the good life and I wanted it again. Mm. So, is, is there stuff from that time you carry with you now, whether it be like a lesson you learned from that time or something you were, you, you, you have from that time that you keep with you forever? Yeah, I mean it's all it's all in you know it's all in me. But um, you know I'm just I'm focused on the future now, and you know I don't rest on my laurels. I I, I don't care about this huge body of music that I did already. No, I'm more concerned about making the new one. We're gonna talk about the new one new one right now. But I want to say, man, like that music is life defining for me. Thank you. No, I mean, I love the music yeah. and I cherish the catalog mm -hmm. that I have, but I just don't walk around bragging about all these, you know. I mean, I did a lot of records, but I'm going to do a lot more. I'd be walking into shawarma shops. I'd be walking into Taco Bell going, you know, I did still dairy. You know that? <laughs> Give me a taco. I'm only kidding. Let's talk about the future. Take a listen to this. That is Trippy Red and taking a walk. You said he's the future. He's part of the My Future collection. Yeah, he's amazing, though. He's dope. He's got his own style. He's he's definitely like a rock star to me, that kid. Production has changed a lot since you started making music, though. Like, How do you find production in 2018? Um, I mean, it's constantly evolving. Yeah. I think that music is in a great place for a producer like myself because it's a lot of keyboard-driven stuff, melody-driven stuff, and... Um, I think people are thirsty for something new. That's where, you know, those type of records come from. And that's not like your traditional trap record. And you would think that you would get something like super, you know, trappy or whatever from, from a young artist like Trippy Red. But he's, he's part of that new breed. He's like a rock star, man. How do, you, how do you find producing trap? It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. I enjoy, really honestly, the sonics of it um, and the sounds and... How the, the the what we play is manipulated and reversed, and there's like all kinds of little you know things like effect tricks and all these different thing programs that we put and mutate our our sounds, and it's cool. I mean, it's interesting to see what what people come up with, but you know, there's a lot of crap, and then there's a lot of really good stuff too that comes. Also, the metrics are different. I mean, when you were starting out, people were still getting played on the radio a lot. There was a lot of money in record sales. There was a lot of money in just vinyl being bought and CDs being bought. Uh, radio play residuals from radio play publishing from, from getting to movies and films. It's a lot of streaming right now. Uh, how do you find the, the change in the economy, too? I mean, it's, it's not the same as it was. No. Uh, you know, if, uh, when we say we have a hit record back in the day, we were making a lot of money off of one hit record. Now it's different, you know, unless it's like a, a major radio record that has a long life at radio, there's not really any any considerable profit from it. You know, a streaming, you know, I actually sat with my publisher not so long ago and he was breaking down numbers to me, like what one song made compared to another. And it was, it was it's unbelievable. Yeah, man, I, got, I, know, I know friends of mine who made you know, tens, twenties of million dollars from one from one song, you know, and uh, I, I I I keep on asking though, like, would you want to start out now? These guys are typically rock bands, though, you know, and they'll say like, no, you know, I, I would never want to start out now. I'm happy I I'm happy I existed in the late nineties. Yeah, and it's it's funny. And there's a lot of producers living in their basements right now, putting stuff up on SoundCloud. In many ways, I still think, and we brought this up earlier, emulating a lot of the work that you did, especially when you first started out, or when you did a lot of the work you were doing in Miami. Do you have any advice for people trying to make and produce hip hop and soul and R and B right now? My advice is always be a pioneer, and create your own sound, and and you know don't do a derivative of whatever you know is is out. You know you want to be a leader, and you know be persistent. You know don't don't give up. 
Well, we're going to play a song at the end of this. What, what song are you most proud of in your career? I don't really have one per se, but I think I really like Let Me Love You from Mario. And just, it's such a warm record and it's open and just it's a beautiful record. Scott Storch, it's so nice to meet you. Likewise. Thanks for coming in, man. My pleasure.